You can ask historians about the most profound change in human society, and most would draw attention to the same point in time. The arrival of civilization brought with it a certain sophistication towards socioeconomic life. Ever since the birth of human civilization at the hands of the Sumerians, things had looked mostly the same, that is, until the arrival of the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century. The Industrial Revolution was an essential step in transforming the world into a global village, as it brought significant progress in means of transportation and communication. All that affected how wars were fought, how people lived and died, what kind of art they made, and how they spent their everyday lives. This change was qualitative, but it was also quantitative, as unlike earlier historical events, the Industrial Revolution was not limited to a single part of the world. Its effects spread across the globe, affecting almost all of humankind to an unprecedented extent. When we think about the Industrial Revolution, we often tend to focus solely on how production and the economy changed, setting inventions and advancements as our primary topic. However, no matter how defining these developments were, they were merely one part of the change brought about by industrialization. One's entire way of life was changed so much that people living in the early 1700s could relate more to their ancestors from antiquity than their descendants from the 1900s. Thus, to fully appreciate the changes brought by the appearance of industry, we have to consider all the effects it had on other aspects of human existence. The first question that typically comes to mind how much did the quality of life improve during the Industrial Revolution? It would be easy to assume it skyrocketed as production peaked and goods became cheaper. However, this has become a matter of considerable debate among scholars in recent decades. One of the reasons for this disparity of opinions is different estimates for the increase of real wages, at least in the case of Great Britain. On the one hand, the more optimistic approximation states that British workers saw a roughly 50% increase in their real wages between 1780 and 1830, combined with the estimated growth of the GDP of about 25% during the same period, this data suggests a staggering improvement in living standards in Britain. However, the pessimistic estimation halts the real wage growth at about 15%, which is below the GDP growth. The other aspect is the position of Britain in a broader European context. Even if the lowest percentage of growth is considered accurate, it is still higher than the rest of mainland Europe, which saw either stagnation or even a drop in real wages due to the Napoleonic Wars. When we continue to follow the issues of wages in the 19th century, now taking into account the rest of Europe, there are some signs of an apparent salary increase. By the 1870s, there was an increase in the average income per head which was between 50 and 200 percent compared to the 18th century. The considerable gap between these two numbers comes from the fact that large parts of southern and eastern Europe were not yet industrialized. Thus, their growth was much smaller. The trend of higher income growth continued in the last phase of the Industrial Revolution until the Great War began. From these numbers, the general picture emerges that industrialization did bring income growth, even for the lower classes. However, its increase seems to have been less than stellar, showing signs of a more gradual improvement. Still, this is not the most crucial aspect of the industrialized economy. Its most outstanding achievement is probably the fact that it managed to break the wage cycle. In the past, the growth in wages caused an increase in population. This in turn caused the lowering of salaries due to the increased workforce, which led to a population decrease. Contrary to this, with the arrival of the Industrial Revolution, both population and wages managed to continue their growth, allowing them to break out of the millennia-long deadlock. As consumerism grew, so did the need for money. In pre-industrial times, at least some of the things used in the household, like clothing or basic utensils, could be homemade. This changed during the Industrial Revolution, as these items had to be bought. Thus, even though prices were falling, more things had to be purchased adding a strain to the household budget. With that in mind, the wage increase may not necessarily mean a more relaxed lifestyle. The balance between the two was somewhat tipped with the arrival of mass production in the early 20th century. With it, prices of various items dropped considerably, while wages continued their steady increase, allowing for a more comfortable life, even for the average working Joe. However, the most significant strain on the household budget was food. 
the price of food remained relatively high as the agricultural advances of the initial phases of the Industrial Revolution were not enough to lower food costs. The population grew with the output, preventing a decrease in prices. The food problem was somewhat lessened by the advances in railway and canal transport, as cheaper food distribution meant more affordable food. The actual breakthrough came in the late 19th century, with the advances in fertilizers and agricultural mechanized machinery. In this era, the average human height increased, which most scholars connect to better diets, though other environmental factors also contributed. By the early 20th century, industrialized nations no longer feared droughts and low harvests. Though they still posed a problem, they no longer threatened to crash the entire economy, which was usually the case in previous centuries. Not only that, the average lifespan grew from about 30 to 35 years in the early 18th century to around 40 to 45 years in the early 20th century. Of course, this increase was not solely caused by better diets. The improvements in medicine also helped, as well as infrastructural advances. For example, fresh running water was introduced in cities by the late 19th century, as water pumps powered by steam engines were used. At roughly the same time, plumbing and canalization were improved, making cities considerably cleaner. However, like many improvements brought by the Industrial Revolution, these came in the later stages. While most of these improvements were a welcome change, other conditions negatively affected the lives of the lower classes. For one, housing posed a problem for a long time, as workers moved to the cities faster than new homes could be built. To speed the housing growth, slums and shanty towns were built. Small, simple dwellings, often made from cheap materials and sometimes even with dirt floors, barely covered basic living needs. To make matters worse, sometimes more than one family would live in one of these homes. That kind of crowding also contributed to the spreading of diseases, most notably tuberculosis. Compared to life in the countryside, where there was enough space, fresh air, and clean water, this was a considerable step back. Yet the economic incentive was enough to continue the growth of the working class. Britain and the Netherlands were the first countries where the urban population outnumbered the rural, while others, like Germany and France, achieved this later in the 19th century. The U.S. was somewhat of an exception among the industrialized nations. Due to the agricultural economy of the South and its westward expansion, its urban population outnumbered the rural only during the 1910s. Besides the living conditions, the working class was also burdened by the working conditions. Factories in the early industrial age were notoriously hazardous. Work safety was usually one of the lowest concerns for owners. Therefore, it wasn't uncommon for workers to be hurt, maimed, or even killed. Miners suffered from a similar fate. They had to work long hours, typically anywhere between 10 and 12 hours per day. To make this matter even worse, kids were often employed, both in factories and mines. However, their smaller size made them perfect for specific jobs, like going down a tight mining shaft. Child labor decreased by the mid-19th century as technology improved and machines were automated to do their jobs. Still, it existed throughout the 19th century, although new laws began to regulate it even tighter. Thanks to that and other improvements in medicine, housing, and nutrition, the child mortality rate started to drop significantly over the century adding yet another reason why the life expectancy and population numbers were rising. Before the Industrial Revolution, society was generally divided into three classes, the aristocracy, the clergy, and the peasants. However, since the Middle Ages, this concept was slowly unraveling. The power of the aristocracy lay in its wealth that came from large properties. However, through the centuries, other ways to earn substantial amounts of money emerged. The most notable was perhaps trading, yet merchants never managed to fully dislodge the nobles from their top social position. However, with the arrival of industrial manufacturing, entrepreneurs and industrialists quickly started earning a lot. As a new motor of the economy, their power and importance quickly grew, and they began overthrowing the aristocrats on the social ladder. Initial investors and industrialists indeed came from noble families as they were the only ones who had enough capital to finance new industrial endeavors. But most of the aristocrats were uninterested in such gambles. As the first phase of the Industrial Revolution continued, new entrepreneurs emerged without a noble background. By the early 19th century, successful industrialists became more powerful than landowning aristocrats. 
The two classes mingled throughout the century, but the nobles rapidly lost their positions. Businessmen and factory owners started to rule the world as the new high class of society. The clergy, once below the aristocrats, was also failing to remain an essential part of society. The priests were once the pinnacle of educated strata, backed by the church, a powerful organization that usually worked closely with the state. However, as education expanded during the Industrial Revolution, a new educated class emerged. It consisted of the managers and clerks, doctors and lawyers, teachers and engineers. They became known as the middle class. The clergy could not sustain its importance as it couldn't fulfill the new roles needed in society. A new economic branch emerged with the increased manufacturing output, growing urbanization, rising population and overall economic growth. Aptly named the service sector, this branch was tasked not with production but with providing services to those who were able to pay. These jobs had existed for millennia, most notably in the forms of taverns and even lawyers. But with the arrival of the industrial age, the need for such businesses grew. These so-called white-collar jobs essentially became the backbone of the middle class. The salaries were usually better, at least when compared to equally skilled laborers, but they also required little to no physical work. This was especially important regarding women, as it meant that they were more than capable of doing the same jobs as men. Workers in various industry branches took over as the main production class of this changing society. The Industrial Revolution was carried out through the hard work of the laborers in mines and factories. However, they were constantly degraded by their employers. Although by the early 20th century, an average worker lived better than in the mid-18th century, at least in the grand scale of things, their benefits were marginal compared to the businessmen. The bubbling dissatisfaction with watching others benefiting from the yield of their hard work continued to grow, and the laborers began revolting, demanding better pay, shorter hours, and better working conditions. All this led to the arrival of new political theories like socialism and communism. In various degrees, these related ideologies had the goal of the state or society taking control of all production, both industry and agriculture, and spreading the gains evenly. The utopian ideal was a society without classes, money, and ultimately, a state where all men and women lived equally. As this was anti-capitalist, anti-monarchist, and anti-religious, supporters of these political parties were dealt with harshly by most authorities in the industrialized countries of the West. Whatever the gains and mistakes of these ideologies or their practitioners, we leave them up to the viewer. However, with the improvements in living conditions in the early 20th century, these violent revolts toned down, though peaceful protests and strikes remained a valid form of fighting for one's rights. Another disenfranchised portion of the population also used these forms of nonviolent protest to fight for their rights. Over the 19th century, in the Western nations, women began their search for equality with men. They asked for the right to vote, equal job opportunities and salaries, easier access to education, ownership, etc. Finally, by the late stages of the Industrial Revolution, women were more widely employed and often had more direct control of their lives. Thus, by allowing women to gain at least some financial independence, the Industrial Revolution allowed them to tackle the matter of their rights head-on. Another essential issue to consider is the Industrial Revolution's impact on slavery. One's logic might be that, with the rise of machine production and mechanized agriculture, the need for slavery would die down. New technology usually did require a skilled laborer, which was something most slaves weren't. There is some truth in this, but it was not so much because of the lesser need for human labor, but because it proved to be more profitable to deal with industry than with slaves. In Britain, the abolition of slavery in most of its colonies came in 1833. In the US, slavery saw a nationwide ban only after the end of the Civil War in 1865. Around this time, most nations, including the less industrial countries of South America and Eastern Europe, also banned slavery, indicating that industrial development had little to do with such a decision. It could be that the abolition of slavery was based more on the development of the Enlightenment ideas of justice and equality than on advances in technology. Another negative trend started by the Industrial Revolution that is still present is pollution and its effects on the environment. Before the development of industry, humans barely affected the environment, at least in comparison. 
They did chop down forests and disposed of their trash in rivers and oceans, but most of their waste was degradable and ultimately not harmful to the environment. However, with the arrival of coal-burning steam engines, air pollution became an important issue. In a matter of decades, cities became covered in smog and smoke. Nonetheless, few argued about it initially, as it was seen as a sign of progress. Later on, with the increased use of various chemicals in the textile industry, rivers became the primary place for toxic waste disposal. This only worsened as new industries were created, and most notably the chemical and gas industries which produced increasingly toxic byproducts. In conclusion, the Industrial Revolution changed almost every aspect of human life, for better or worse. One must take a brief look at the life before the Industrial Revolution feudal landlords, no rights for minorities, including women, the lowly lifestyle of the majority of the population, a deep-seated hierarchical social ladder with mainstays. Today, even if other issues have taken their place, those age-old issues do not exist in their feeble forms. That is the real impact of the Industrial Revolution. To learn more about what is the real impact of the Industrial Revolution, check out our book, The Industrial Revolution. A captivating guide to the period of major industrialization of the spinning jenny, the cotton gin, electricity, and other inventions. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free mythology bundle ebook while it's still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.